From at least as early as the Roman occupation of Britain, black men and women appear in the written record across all levels of society. There is the black legionary who makes fun of the Roman Emperor Severus, himself from Libya, outside Carlisle in 210 AD. The landing of black slaves by Viking raiders in Ireland in 862 AD. The Vikings and Irish called them blue men. And Hadrian, an early Christian scholar who was instrumental in founding an internationally recognised centre of learning at Canterbury in the late 7th century. Hadrian, also likely from Libya, is credited with introducing the study of Greek, Plato and Aristotle to the English Anglo-Saxons. Greater numbers arrived during the age of exploration and colonisation from the late 1400s onwards. Yet perhaps contrary to popular expectations, whilst countries like Spain and Portugal were slave societies, England was not. Slavery in England was and remained illegal. Thus, during the 15 and early 1600s, i.e. the Tudor and Stuart periods, black men and women were found living free and sometimes fully independent lives in often the most unexpected places. Hello there. Their stories are remarkable. John Blank was a black trumpeter who joined the royal court of Henry VII, the first Tudor king and victor of the War of the Roses. Blank would have performed regularly for the royal court, including at the funeral of Henry VII in 1509 and at the subsequent coronation of his son, Henry VIII. The infamous younger Henry must have liked John. He agreed to the trumpeter's written request for a pay rise. His wages were doubled to £24 a year, six times the average servant's wage. And when John got married in 1512, likely to a white Englishwoman, Henry bought John a violet gown and hat as a wedding present. Later, when Henry's 400-ton flagship, the Mary Rose, sunk two miles south of Portsmouth Harbour in 1545, one of the salvage crews hired to recover its valuable artillery contained at least one specialist diver of African origin, 19-year-old Jacques Francis from West Africa. Unlike the Tudor English, black Africans were known for their expert swimming abilities. And yet despite this, only a few guns were retrieved. Although, in fairness, this seems to have been viewed as a relative success, a previous salvage attempt made by a crew of 31 Venetians and 60 English sailors had itself failed to recover the wreckage, although they did find time to build the treasury for all the alcohol they drank. 35,904 pints of beer in less than one month. The English experience at sea was not always one of such abject failure. National heroes were made of men like Sir Francis Drake. Famous for his 1577 circumnavigation of the globe, his exploits during the Spanish Armada in 1588, and for his stealing of Spanish ships, gold and black slaves. Thus men like Diego, Having fled his Spanish captors in Panama and subsequently worked as Drake's paid servant in his Portsmouth home and aboard his ships, were made free. Another ex-slave who likely made his way to England via one of Drake's raiding voyages was Edward Swarth. He worked as a porter in England in Edward Winter's country manor house in the late 1500s and is remembered today for being ordered to and carrying out the beating of another employee of Winters, a white man named John Guy. The subsequent lawsuit Guy filed against his employer was heard by some of the most influential members of Elizabethan society, William and Robert Cecil, the Earl of Essex, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And so, incidentally, was the testimony of the black former slave, Edward Soir, Exact numbers are difficult to calculate, 
but it is more or less certain that there were many hundreds of black men and women living in England by the 15 and 1600s. Like many English men and women, most worked as servants, but there were some who had their own businesses and were independent. Men like reasonable black men, who worked as a silk weaver in London in the late 1500s. He was married, again most likely to a white Englishwoman, and had his children baptised in the local parish church. Unfortunately, soon after, his children appear again in the written record, having died during the plague epidemic of 1592. Not much else is known about the Blackman family during this period, if acceding to official government advice, as plague victims they would have self-isolated and painted a red cross across their front door. Official guidance also suggested the consumption of vinegar-based remedies or the eating of bread and butter to combat the infection. Another popular remedy of the time advised the pressing of freshly plucked chickens against the weeping plague sores or for poor families like the Blackmans, pigeons could be used. As the 16th century gave way to the early 17th, and England began to engage more successfully in international trade and exploration, so too did people of these new lands make their way back to England. Some were African royalty. In 1610, Prince Didiri Jahwo spent two years in England learning its language and culture, before returning to his native lands near the River Sestos in modern-day Liberia. Jahwo came willingly. Another, Kauri, from modern-day South Africa, was taken by force aboard an East India ship to England in 1613. Unsurprisingly, Corey was not altogether pleased with his treatment, and would each day lie on the floor of Sir Thomas Smith's house where he was staying, and repeat the words, Corey go home. The company gifted him a suit of armour made of brass, his tribe's favourite metal, and did indeed return him home in June 1614. Thereafter, Corey was able to enact some measure of revenge upon his captors, Following his return, he advised his countrymen to trade their pepper, rice and ivory for gold, not, as was previously the practice, their much-loved but relatively inexpensive brass. It was duly noted that this caused much annoyance to subsequent European traders to the region. Thanks for listening. If you like this, subscribe and hit the notification bell.